after the recording now it's going so good morning Bernie uh, my name is Claudio calling you from Washington DC uh, let's make a formal introduction for our listeners from the studios in Fairfax City we are very humble and grateful that Bernie Shirabali accepted our invitation to the show uh, growing up in Northern California Bernie began writing songs at the age of 13 eventually Bernie relocated to Los Angeles in 1984, and a chance meeting with Kansas lead singer brought him to the attention of musician David Pack. When Pack left his gig playing guitar with Mike McDonald, um, he recommended Bernie for the position. At the rest, as they say, in the music industry, the rest is history. Bernie, welcome to the show, man. Oh, thank you. Thanks, thanks for having me, Claudia. No, no problem. This has been a, a very weird year for everybody with the virus. Um, people lost a job, and you know. Touring musicians like yourself can know what's like and the tour and stuff. How is this affecting your your creativity in general? Well, my creativity as a writer, it, it's actually been kind of a sort of a jolt for me. I mean, I've actually written more um, at home than I've written in a long time, you know, because it's I can't play live. And, you know, and the subject matter of being isolated and what's going on in our country, in our world. It's been kind of inspiring to write for me. So I've, I've written probably a good 30 songs this year and uh, put out two albums, actually. Um, so in that sense, it's been positive. Um, I miss playing with Michael and, and the band a lot. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's like the other half of me is, is playing live is really, a, I miss that tremendously. I really do. But I'm making the best of it. Yeah, you had the opportunity compared to other musicians that uh, musicians, as far as I know, they get get paid a good money when they go on, on tour, right? Making CD, making album, it's a lot of effort. You need to promote the stuff and uh, uh, you won't see any money right away, right? Right. I mean, yeah. You have the, the, the you know, opportunity. They have a studio home. You can do your own thing. Many people cannot, right? Can... Yeah. I, you know, I've often said that uh, playing playing music I don't really get paid for playing music. I get paid for traveling, <laughs> traveling and staying in hotels and being on buses and being in airports. That, that part is what you get paid for. Cause that's the hard part. The, the playing music is, is a joy, especially with the caliber of musicians. I get, to, get to play with like Michael and in the band. They're, they're just so inspiring to me. You know, they make me better. I think. You know? on, on average, how many gigs were you guys doing a year? On average, I'd say about a hundred, you know, a year, probably a hundred dates a year. Oh, with Mar no, 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 not everything with Michael McDonald. You were playing with other people, right? Or not? Uh, you know, I pretty much exclusively I've been playing with Michael for uh, for thirty over thirty years. Um, I've done a little bit with Ambrosia, yeah, uh, a little bit with Michael's wife Amy, um, yeah. um, but mostly Michael. I mean, I've I've purposely kept it that way because. Uh, I want to be available when Mike calls me <laughs> and um, I don't want to be tied up in some other gig where I'm committed to them. Uh, yeah, yeah. Michael's my, Michael's my first choice to play with for sure. Plus you guys been working together, been writing partners for many years. So it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. We're, and we're, we're, and I'm proud to say we're friends, you know, and that's, that's, that means probably the most to me. It really does. He's Absolutely, a, man. Sweet. Guy. Were, were you born like in a musical family and how old were you when you began Got your first guitar or playing guitar or trying uh, to play guitar? When I, I'm not, neither, I mean, my parents weren't really musical per se. They, they, uh, my dad played tuba in high school. Yeah. They, they played music around the house a lot. Uh, we always had records playing. You know, my parents had a nice hi fi record player. And yeah. um, so they all, I was always hearing music in the house. Um, and I, I don't know exactly why. I have to talk to my mom about this, but they got me piano lessons when I was nine. I guess somebody told them that I had an ear. And so yeah. I, I took piano lessons from a neighbor, but I, I got bored with it really quick. I didn't, I didn't want to look at the music. I wanted to remember it and memorize it all. And so my, my music teacher said, he's hopeless, you know? And uh, so, but then, you know. but then the, the Beatles came on, uh, yeah. Sullivan, that's kind of the story of so many musicians from yeah. my age. Um, I saw them and I went, oh, that I want to do that. Um, 
and I really actually wanted to be a drummer because I, I just thought the drums looked so cool. And uh, but my parents wouldn't hear that. They didn't want any drums bashing around the house. So I said, well, how about a guitar? So they bought me a guitar. And that's, that's kind of where it started. You know, and then I started getting Beatle records. And uh, the first record I really got into, <laughs> it's going to sound crazy, but it was Dean Martin. Uh, really? Yeah. Everybody loves somebody. I mean, I just love that song. I played it over and over and over. And I kind of learned to sing from that record. And, uh, and then, of course, the Beatles and the whole California music scene and the British scene I really got into. Um, so that's kind of when it started. I, I guess it was around 11 or 12 when I got my first guitar. Um, yeah, that's kind of where I started. And then some, a lot of my friends got instruments and we started playing in bands. Probably around 12, 13 years old is when I first started playing in bands. Yeah. Yeah. And then, so between you were in middle school, where you, high school, were you, uh, sorry, personal question, were you a good, 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 good student? It was, was when you told your parents, well, I want to move and I want to give music a try, they were, they were going crazy or they say, well, tr they try it out for a year? Yeah, they thought I was nuts. Um, I, you know, I was, I wasn't great in school. No, I didn't do really good. Um, I, the arts kind of classes, like, uh, you know, English and, and arts and music classes, I did really well. And math, I was horrible. Yeah. Uh, anything academic like that, I wasn't very good. But, um, you know, my parents didn't really pay much attention to it until I got a little older, um, until I was maybe 17, 18. Uh, then they started to be concerned, like, you're still doing this? You know, and uh, it, it, it didn't go well at first. Um, But as I got a little older and started to do it professionally, they kind of went, oh, he's pretty good, I guess. You know, maybe he knows what he's doing. And they supported me after that. But yeah, it was kind of a rocky road at first, for sure. Absolutely. I mean, I can understand it back then. A, a, you know, a parent could be worried about their, chil their child's future, you know, being a musician. But they were very strict at school. You know, you need to get beats and I'm better in every class or your mom checking your <laughs> your homework I, daily, yeah. like we do with my son. <laughs> like I was a 17 year old boy, that's what. <laughs> they're, they're, you know, I'm, I think we've been more strict with our kids, uh, honestly, but you know, my parents didn't ride me that hard about school, to be honest with you. I mean, I, I passed everything. I mean, I, I didn't really fail anything. So it just was, like I said, it wasn't really till I was going to maybe do it as a living. That's when they got concerned, you know, and understandably so. But they've changed their tune. Actually, my mom, my dad's not around anymore, but they both supported me for years and years. They encouraged me. So that well, was look at you, Bob. Look at you now, man. So look back. You have. I've been, I've been fortunate. I really have. I've been. I'm really grateful for, you know, the breaks I've gotten. You know, it's been nice. Well, you, you, you're very good. You're very humble and very good. Otherwise, you wouldn't be with Mike McDonald and, and, and with all the other bands that you have. Yeah, you know, play you. or being around with. So, and then, so you were then. In Northern California, and then when were you when you moved to Los Angeles, I believe, right? Uh, that was in the early 80s. I'd say 83, 84. We went down. Um, a producer heard us. I can't remember. Steve. I wish I should remember his last name. Anyway, he, he brought us down to Los Angeles, and we did a whole album down there, um, a band called Page One. And, that, was your, that was your band that, after high school? Uh, But before then, I was in a band called Logos. We were in a Bay Area band, but yeah, then it turned into Page One. And we went down to Los Angeles, cut an album. We actually, and then we decided to move down there because we thought, oh, maybe we can make it down here. And um, we kind of didn't. <laughs> uh, we, we played a lot. We, we, we worked a ton, like six nights a week, five sets a night kind of thing. We, we really played a lot. That's when I paid my dues, I'd say. And... Um, We learned to play, you know, we learned to play in clubs and, but it didn't pan out. And um, I was there for maybe three, four years in Los Angeles and um, almost ready to give it up because it just wasn't going well down there. But we happened to be playing in this club in Newport Beach down in Southern California. And this guy came up to us and said, we had a woman bass player, uh, Flavia. And he, he said, uh, Hey, you guys are really good. Uh, my friend is looking for a bass player, a woman bass player for his video that he's doing for a movie. 
would you be interested? And we said, yeah, we'll talk to her about it. And it turned out to be David Pack from Ambrosia. Yeah. And he was, uh, he was doing the soundtrack for um, White Nights with uh, Gregory Hines and Barishnikov. Uh, it was a, kind of a big movie. And David had like a half dozen songs in it. And he wanted to do a, a video with it. And Flavia did the video. And he said, well, if there's anything I can ever do to thank you. And she said, well, as a matter of fact, my, uh, my band member is a great songwriter and we could use some help. So David heard my stuff and really liked it. And he wow. called me and he immediately just took, we, we became friends and David provided me with an eight track analog machine and um, said, man, you need a better machine to make your demos on. And David really, really, really was a big jolt in the arm for me. And, you know, He's, I have huge respect for him. And then he was playing with Michael and, um, and he was going to be leaving Michael's band. He was playing guitar for Michael. And he said, well, I'm going to be, you know, would you be interested in auditioning for Michael? And I'm like, yeah. And, um, and, you know, it's funny because I never, I was, a, I was a fan of the Doobie Brothers, but not like a rapid fan or anything. I knew of their stuff and I liked it. So it was, it came out of left field. I had, it, I just didn't see it coming. And next thing I know, I'm auditioning for the band and I get the gig. And, um, and needless to say, I stayed in Los Angeles because uh, Mike hired me and uh, been with him ever since. You remember, I don't know, maybe you do, maybe you don't, how many people auditioned, auditioned for that? It's, I mean, it was very yeah, difficult, I imagine. Yeah, there were, there, were, there were about a half dozen other players. And they were named players. One of them uh, was a friend of mine now, Grant Geisman, uh, who's a very predominant session player. He auditioned, so I thought sure he was going to get it. Sure, and, and um, I think Mike, he's very conscious of people's personalities, and not to say because Grant's a great guy, don't get me wrong, but he's very conscious about relationships and bands, and um, I think he just felt like I would mix well, you know, not only as a player but as a person. It just felt right, and. We both had a, a mutual love of dogs <laughs> that came up in a conversation saying, well, oh, a dog person, I like this. So <laughs> I'm not saying that got me the gig, but it, it might have helped. You know? That obviously improved the chances, right? Yeah. yeah, I think so. I think it did. It, it's tough to be, a, as I say before, right? So I want to repeat myself. I, I like music. I go to shows. I, I have the chance to meet, meet a lot of people in different small clubs where I buy the stuff, they sign the autograph, and I have a, a huge music collection, but I have no idea how difficult it is for the, the band going from town to town, catch a fly, go to bed at three o'clock in the morning, wake up at seven and go to another gig, and, and the personality within them, and the spouse get involved. It's, it must be very, very difficult, man. It's, it can be, yeah. I, I mean, any job is difficult in its own way, but... Yeah, the traveling, that's what I said before. It's like, uh, that's what I get paid for is the traveling and the, like you said, early lobby calls and crazy bus rides. You know, it's like many nights, most of the nights when we're on tour, we finish a show at, at 1030 at night. And then an hour later, we get on a tour bus and we drive for eight to 10 hours you know, to the next city. And a lot of nights, a lot of days, the uh, show the next night. So it's all you can do to get sleep. You know, it's it, that that's challenging. And, um, but you know, I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade it for anything. You know, it's, um, yeah. So at the time now you begin making a living, right? So your parents were okay. Now they say, well, like, this guy's doing okay. It's not bad. <laughs> you know, and the thing is, like I said before, we, you know, we're out a hundred, uh, you know, we do a hundred shows a day, a year, on average, and I don't know what that average is out, how many days, you, you, you were probably out for five months out of the year, you know, if you if you added all the days up. Uh, but then I'm home for five five months. So, you know, it balances out, I, it's it's okay. You know, I'm, you know, a nine to five, I would have to go to work and, you know, commute every day. So it, it's it's a trade off, but it's fine. And then, uh, and then even before that, you, you decided, well, when you went to Los Angeles, right? Music, I need to make it, right? Otherwise, sort of, you didn't have like a plan B, right? Plan B would be get a job and go to school, you know, apply to college. And, but you say, no, I, this music in my stuff. And yeah, it's funny you say that because I, I remember being, even when I was 13, 14 years old, 
I knew that's all. I, I, I went, well, what else could I do? I don't, I don't have any other talents. I guess I could go in the service like, you know, like my dad did. I had no idea. I just, I just, I knew in some ways I felt it, it was a downfall, but in some ways I was fortunate because I knew from a very early age that that's what I was going to do no matter what, you know? So I had a determination at a very young age. So yeah, I didn't have a plan B. No, I didn't. <laughs> and then uh, remember the first time you, you guys wrote a song with Mike? In my mm -hmm. how many years after? So you you guys were touring a hundred nights a year or so. so. And then how long did it take before you guys you helped him out with the, with the first record? And that came very early, actually. Um, you know, David. I, I stayed friends with David Pack, and yeah. you know, David said, you know, you ought to play some of your stuff for Michael. I think he would like this stuff. But he he told me he goes, Mike likes to hear. He likes to hear the music, but don't write any words. Just give him a track, you know, because he likes to improvise on somebody else's music. It's yeah. one way of writing. So he goes, you know, just keep that in mind when you're showing. So it was maybe, maybe I was in the band for, I, I swear, less than a year. And um, I, did, I did that. I, I got the courage and I played it for Mike. And he called me and said, I really like this. I want to get together. So he lived in Santa Barbara and I lived in the San Fernando Valley. So it was a good 80 miles apart. And, uh, but he drove down to the valley and came to my apartment. And I'll never forget it. Um, I, we had the track and I had my little studio set up in my apartment. And he goes, he said, uh, well, let me just kind of sing along to your track. He put the headphones on, and I remember I had a Rolling Stone magazine, and he picked it up, and he was reading it, and then the music started playing, and I'm like, is he going to sing or what? <laughs> and he was reading the magazine, then the part came around where he was going to sing, and he put it down, and he started singing these lyrics that he had in his head, and I was like, oh, my goodness, and um, that was the first time. It was a song called One More Word uh, that, that we ended up, I ended up putting a, an album called uh, called Wedding Can Street. Um, was, I think it was my first album that I did with Chaz Frictel, but that was my first time writing with Mike. So it, it was very early, very early on. And he was always very receptive uh, to hearing anything I had. And he would all, often say, "Let's we should write together. And so I'd go up to his house in Santa Barbara. And we've written maybe over the years, we've written maybe 40 songs together. I mean, a lot. We've written oh, a lot. That's very impressive, man. Yeah, you know, you know, they haven't all gotten used. Um, but maybe about half of those have been published, you know, which is, I, he is the most unique, unusual songwriter I've ever worked with. Which, which way? Well, he's just, first off, his lyric, uh, reference is just, sometimes it's hard to know where he's going with a lyric because he's so unusual with his verbiage. I mean, he just comes up with these phrases and you're like, what? What does this mean? It's almost like you're trying to figure out the song as you're writing it. And I think he is too. He just hears these strange, uh, he reminds me sort of Joni Mitchell sometimes. Uh, you know, it's, it's very visual, very emotional, very spiritual in a way. Um, and then his phrasing is just like, like I'm, I always marvel at the way he'll play keyboard, but his, his singing is not necessarily in sync with what he's playing per se. It's not very rhythmic. Like for me, when I write, I'm, I pretty much stay in the rhythm of the song, which I think a lot of writers do. But Mike, not Mike, it's almost like he has his, the two sides of his brain. It's like he's thinking vocal and he's thinking keyboard. He, they're not necessarily the same, Line. you know, yeah. but, but it works. It works beautifully. And uh, so he's taught me a lot about writing, not to be so predictable. You know, but he does it in a way where it's natural. You know, he's he's really he's really a marvel as far as I'm concerned. Was Mike McDonald sort of famous at the time, right? When you I mean, before after the yeah, Dewey Brothers, or with the Dewey Brothers, he he had some hits already, right? Oh, absolutely. He this was, I mean, I'm, I I started working with him in 1988, so he became a solo artist in 1982. So oh, okay, he was already doing his solo thing for five, six years when I joined. 
so yeah, he was he was famous. Uh, I mean, it's funny because a lot of people still did, kind of didn't know who he was, you know, because you'd go, well, you know, the guy that sings Take It to the Streets or, or Men of Man, oh, that guy, you know. He was still kind of becoming famous in his own right as Michael McDonald. Um, but yeah, he was very well known and very, very successful at this point when he was doing his own solo thing, for sure. I mean, he was only in the Doobie Brothers for seven years or something. It, it wasn't it wasn't that long, you know, before he went on his own. And he's been a solo artist for 40 years or something close to it, you know. Wow. Uh, and then I don't know what is an echo there, but so, um, how long did and then when we, did you release your first record? Were you in the band with him already or before that or? With my record or yeah, or, your, your your stuff, your own stuff, your own. My my first solo record I put out in 1996. Um, oh, so, so many many years after, right? So yeah, about six six seven years after I was with Mike, I did do a solo. Pro I did a, another project with Chaz Fertel, who was the bass player with Mike. Yeah, was a tremendous talent. Um, uh, we did a, an album called uh, under the pseudonym of uh, Silent Partner. And that was in 1992. We did that project together. And George Pirelli, who was Michael's drummer at the time, played drums on it. It's, it's a good little record. It's not bad. Um, but yeah, my solo, first solo record I put out in 96 when I was with Mike. And there's actually, uh, I think there's some, that's, that had one, oh, well, maybe, I don't know. I don't know if we had a, I had a Mike song in there or not. Can't remember, but uh, can't remember my own records. But uh yeah. And, and in all during that, I'd always write with Mike and some of the songs we wrote didn't make it to his. So I'd put them on my records, you know, or other people would cut them, you know. So I got you. Are you still friends with uh, David Pack? I, I really like Ambrosia. Yeah. Well, yeah. Of course, I'm a very good fan. Yeah. I'm in touch with David. Yeah, we uh, I've no. Yeah. David, every once in a while, we'd play in Los Angeles area. He'd come to the shows and would sit in with us or just hang out with us. Yeah, we're still in touch. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, I, for me, I, I like so many groups for many different reasons. I, I, I'm, 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 I'm on purpose, I'm always looking for new bands. Mm -hmm. Like when they're on this radio project together, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I'm always looking for new, 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 new music, new bands. So, although I, I like, you know, Peter Gabriel, Genesis, you guys, Pink Floyd, I'm the same. I'm the same. Play Pat Benatar, you know, Blonde, and I have seen so many. I'm always looking for new people, new, new, new people. For me, me too, me too. Um, yeah, David, I, I, you know, I'm friends with the guys at Ambrosia too. I, you know, he left the band. Yeah, and yeah. they're kind of on, they're kind of on the outs, unfortunately. Uh, I wish they would. I think they would be really successful if they reunited because they were very popular. Mm -hmm. And but I played some gigs with them after David left. Yeah. So so I I. I'm friends with those guys. They're all really, really sweet guys. Uh, Joe Puerte, uh, early Drummond, just the greatest guys. Chris North, really good guys. And then there's no way that they can get to, I don't know, there's a lot of quality. Yeah, I don't want to say no way, but it doesn't look that way. They're, they're, it's, it's pretty, uh, it's, it's not good. They, they don't have a good relationship, but you never know. You know, you never know. So after you you audition with Michael McDonald, you know you be, you guys began rehearsing. Do you remember the first gig, the first show? I'm quite sure you remember. You absolutely. Uh, what I remember really vividly was the very first time I my audition. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. And and it was at David Pack's recording studio um, in the Valley, in Sunland, California. And I remember going there. And uh, there was no drummer. Uh, it was just it was just Michael, um, Chuck Sabatino, who was the keyboard player, and Scott Plunkett, who was the keyboard player. So it was basically three keyboard players, no bass player either. It was just the three keyboard players and me. And we were in the control room of the studio, so it was kind of an unusual environment. It was it was kind of scary, to be honest with you, because it was very naked, so to speak, and. Um, and I had listened, I had studied the, the board tape, as they call it, the live uh, cassette of their show. 
I'd studied it like crazy. So I knew every song inside out. I was prepared. But I didn't know what vocal parts I was supposed to sing. Uh, I, you know, they didn't really specify you're going to take this part or that part. So I just kind of, I knew the lyrics, but I didn't really know which part I was going to take. So the audition came and I said, well, which part should I take? And Mike goes, well, can you grab the top part? And I'm like, oh my God, I was petrified because a lot of his parts were like, uh, what a fool believes those high harmonies. Oh they're, yeah. They're in the stratosphere and our <laughs> are, are, are real love, you know, it's like, are you kidding me? And I was always in my bands, I was kind of the lead singer. So I wasn't used to singing backups necessarily. I would do it when I record, but I was not prepared to sing those high parts. And we came to real love and I'll never forget it. I said, okay, I'll give it a shot. And I did it. And I, I did it, but I didn't, I didn't think I did a great job. I just went, oh man. I said, Mike, I'm sorry. I, I, I that's kind of high for me. And he goes, oh, don't worry about it. You'll get it. You know, as time goes on, you'll get it. So he was already kind of hinting that he liked it, but it scared me because I thought I blew the audition because I couldn't reach those high parts. And, um, and you know, as time went on, he's right. I did warm up to those parts and I, I sang them. I sang all those high parts. Uh, so that was cool. And then the other thing I really remember was the audition went well. And then we did one rehearsal, one rehearsal with the full band. That was it. And then we went to play. <laughs> and, and I remember hey. that was one rehearsal. That was it. And, and Mike doesn't like to rehearse. He's, he's not a, he doesn't like rehearsals. And um, so I remember after that first rehearsal, we went to grab dinner somewhere. And Mike said to me, um, we were in his Mercedes. I'll never forget it. And he goes, so uh, have you ever played in front of big audiences before? <laughs> and I went, yeah, I have. Yeah, you know, I've been doing it for years. And because he didn't know much about me, really? and, then, and then he goes, he goes, uh, oh yeah, about the dress code. And I said, yeah. And he goes, there is none. <laughs> he was like, wear whatever you want. So that was it. And then we went. Um, I think the first show we did was in, uh, not San San Antonio. I think it was San Antonio, Texas. And it got rained out. It was it was the third of July or fourth of July, and uh, so we, the the show was canceled that night or postponed. And then we did it the next day. Um, okay, I take it back. It was Ventura, California. That was the second show. Ventura, Ventura, California was my first show, um, and I, it was. Just a beautiful, beautiful experience. It really was. And and Mike's band, they were all so embracing of me and just really welcoming. And it, it, it was just a beautiful thing. It really was. It really was. Yeah. Although you, you were the only new person to that, that group of people that were playing with him, but I imagine that you guys will do at least a week worth of rehearsal. Well, of course, I don't know anything about your world, but... One day. It was one day. Those guys were already pretty tight i mean they knew the show yeah because uh, they'd been there for a little bit um so i just like i said i studied that tape and they could tell i i was i was ready you know and like i said mike does not like rehearsals you know when we when we do a new show like if we're if he puts a new record out yeah we'll take four or five days and rehearse because it's, it's new to everybody right. but in this particular case i was just the only one that really needed to, to be studied so yeah. It was scary, but, you know, I, I've been doing it for years. So, I, you know, I was, I was a pro at that point, too. So, Were you, yeah. were you nervous the night before or in the morning, in the morning or evening before the... Yeah, I was nervous. But, you know, I, that kind of nervous energy is kind of a good thing. If you're not nervous, you should worry, <laughs> you know, because then, then, then you're, you're being too complacent or too bored. I, I, yeah. I'm always nervous before a show, but it's, it's a good nervous Wow, I was I was looking to um, to I want to shift gear a little bit and then go. I, I went to the website and just to mention a couple of songs and I. Uh, what can you tell me about the Miracle River? How the song came together? Is the one with Judy Collins the first one that you got? It's a yeah. beautiful, beautiful arrangement. There. Thank you. Yeah, I'm really proud of that song. It, you know, it was originally we wrote it for Amy, Mike's wife. That's on her album uh, called Journey to Miracle River. 
Um, and uh, Amy, um, we talked, you know, this was about, about early 2000s. Uh, Amy started to express that she wanted to do an album. And, and, and Amy and I were friends because of me playing with Michael. And Amy had a solo career of her own uh, back in the 80s. She put out two albums, I think, on Capitol Records. But then she sort of just retired and didn't do it. But she always had song ideas in her head. And so we started writing together here at my house. And I'm trying to remember how we met John Goodwin. Uh, don't exactly remember how that came about. But uh, John and I and Amy uh, were at Amy's house out in Weeper's Fork here in Nashville. And John is a brilliant poet. And um, we would get together with John when it was the three of us. And John would just come with stacks of lyrics, like poems. And he'd go, well, what about this one? And we'd go, yeah, it's okay. What else you got? And um, then he read, he had a good deal of Miracle River started as a, as a, uh, as a lyric. And we went, oh, that's beautiful. And so we kind of went, well, what, what kind of a feel did you have in mind for this? So I just picked up my guitar and started playing those chords um, and the rhythm. And I, I wrote all the music to it. And Amy wrote pretty much the melody. Um, and then we all kind of shaped it together. We did it in her cabin. Uh, I'll never forget it. And then, um, and then we cut it later at my house. But then, you know, Amy's views, I, I'm always kind of a little partial to Amy's version because uh, it was kind of the initial version. But let me tell you, when I heard that, that, that Judy Collins wanted to do it, I, I nearly cried. I mean, because it was, I mean, she's one of my idols. And, um, and uh, so that was just a huge shot in the arm for me. And then Michael doing the duet with her was just the icing on the cake. Um, yeah. And then he wrote the original or the, the additional out section uh, that he does. Like he built this little chorus of uh, vocals on the end of it. That wasn't part of the original song. Mike came up with that. I mean, I almost feel like he should be a co-writer in it. But, um, you know, we'd, we'd already written the song beforehand. But both versions I love. And I, did, I got to meet Judy uh, back in, uh, I don't know, I guess that was about five years ago. She played here in Nashville. Super sweet lady. You know, she's like 80 years old or something, and she's still, well, gigging it. Yeah. Now she isn't, but I've got to see her show, and she was just, she's just, her voice is almost better than ever. Really, really, really great show. Great stamina, great stories. Just beautiful, beautiful person. Wonderful. It's a beautiful, yeah. If I listened to the, right, the first one on the left, I remember I had sort of photographic memory, and uh, I listened to a stuff like six times last night, and I was putting the question to bed. It's, it, it's the lyrics, the arrangement, the boy. I mean, it's it's very, very well done, right? Very, very Thank well you. done. Very Thank you. Yes, they they uh, Judy pretty much copied our arrangement. You yeah, know, yeah. It, they pretty much stuck to the arrangement, which was flattering, believe me. What about the beautiful child? Beautiful child. Wow. Um, Mike and I wrote that here. In, right in, in, the this, house? In, in this house, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's about his son, uh, Dylan. And Dylan was maybe, gosh, I don't know how old he was. He was an, a young teenager, I think, at the time. And um, Dylan, he, he, was, he was a handful when he was younger. <laughs> and I think, uh, you know, I think Mike was stressed out about it a little bit. But we wrote that together. Mike actually came up with the initial idea on guitar. Um, Mike's, Mike loves to write on guitar. Um, and so we, we hashed that out together. And um, I, I, we, that was a, a, we both really contributed equally on that song. Some of the songs that we've written together, Mike has been pretty much the predominant writer, and I help him finish it. But that, for instance, was a very much a 50-50 song. Um, and he originally cut it uh, out of his studio when he lived here in Nashville. And... Um, he gave it to an, uh, an artist named uh, Chris Eddy. And Chris Eddy is, uh, is Dwayne Eddy's son. So I was disappointed. I was like, oh, Mike, I want, I want you to do the song. And sure enough, as time went by, that, that project kind of fizzled out. 
and then Mike brought it back for his wide open record. So I was, I was thrilled, but that song's been around for gosh, 17, 18 years, uh, a long time. And I was, I was, and then we finally got to do it in the live show and man, I, it, it's just so much fun to play that song. It's, uh, it's so different from Mike because uh, it's more rock. It's a little more edgier when the chorus comes in. I could really play power chords, and it's it's a little more theatrical for Mike. And and uh, and I know Mike loves it too. So yeah, that what a gift that song. I, lo I love that song. I really do. Is any of Michael McDonald kids are musicians at all? Yeah, yeah. Dylan is. Uh, yeah, you should check out Dylan. Uh, yeah. Dylan McDonald and the Avions. Uh, Yeah, they've got two or three albums out. Uh, Dylan's great, but he's nothing like his father. Uh, he's He sounds, and Dylan, if you're watching this, forgive me, but he almost sounds more like Neil Young or or Ryan Adams. Uh, he sounds a little like, to me, like the uh, Jeff Tweedy from uh, Wilco. Yep, yep. Um, it's much more uh, California rock kind of sounding. I love it. Dylan has sang uh, on a couple of my records. Uh, sung, sang background parts and then his daughter Scarlett is very very musical but she doesn't do it she's very shy about it but she she's got a beautiful voice uh, Charlotte, sang, let me check him out yeah let me she sang on one of Mike's records when she was still a young girl uh, on his Christmas album I, for, I think it's on uh, what's the name of that album gosh I can't remember it's it's not in the spirit but it's the one he did later Uh, I'll think of it, but uh, she sings on it. She just sounds like an angel, and she plays banjo and I think a little bit of ukulele. She's she's very both both his kids are very musical, but Dylan does it more professionally, I think. Uh, um, but you know, these days it's hard for bands. You know, it's it's, it's a struggle. It really is. Let me, let me ask. Uh, I don't know how to ask this question, but well, I will ask you though. Mm -hmm. The, the way I think it is it difficult to to make it on your own being the son of like the kids of Michael McJo Mac Michael Jordan right the, the, I like basketball right so mm -hmm. yeah I was gifted but the kids were good but average and so is, is it difficult to be the son of Michael McDonald yeah. you know your son if he was a musician or whatever yeah. I think it I think it is I mean from You know, I've really not talked to Dylan specifically about it, but I can tell that, you know, he's like, like I said, his music, his style is completely different from his father's because, you know, you know, and I know sometimes I've seen comments where people go, well, he sings nothing like his father. Well, why should he? You why know? should, you know, why should he? He's not his father, you know? I mean, look at the, look at the Lennons, you know, look at John and, or Sean and Julian. I mean, poor Julian Lennon was, I mean, he was totally compared to John and, and it, it was devastating for him, you know, and I can see it's devastating for Sean too, but they both become their own people. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, I can, I, I definitely think it's difficult. Absolutely. It yeah. helped you out at the beginning with the first six months, somebody to give you a chance. Michael McDonald would make a call and somebody would help you out. But yeah, yeah. It get to a point where, well, if you're not good enough, I don't care who your dad is, right? We need to sell record. We need to sell show and. That's right. That's right. right. You, you're, you, you've got to, you've got to stand on your own eventually. Yeah, yeah. Not just the name. I mean, the Lennons are a perfect example. I mean, who's bigger than John Lennon? You know, yeah. so, you know, I, I got some records. Of course I, I had them. Some Sean and Julian from 80 something. I, 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 he, yeah. he was very good. I had, well, I, I suppose that when there's, John Lennon, the, the fortune of the amount of money is so much that you will inherit that 100 million, 200 million, whatever the amount is. Mm. There's no effort and energy to, uh, you know, to go on your own and try to do something because whether yeah. you do something or you don't wake up every morning in the morning, you will have millions on your back. I, I, I think it's That's in good. a way it's better, better, better to be poor, if you will. That's a good point. I, 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 I think that too, because, you know, I, it was always a struggle for me, you know, you, and, and I think you, when you're more hungry for it, of uh, course, yeah. you, go, you go after it. Um, but yeah, I, I like, uh, I, I actually like uh, Sean, Sean Lennon's uh, 
friendly mm-hmm. fire record a lot. I think, you know, oh, yeah, yeah. and he, now he's, he's, he's doing some really edgy, different thing, kind of things. You know, I got, got to hand it to him. He's really uh, become his own musician. Um, and he avoids being in his dad's spotlight, you know, of course. You know? Of course. But yeah, if you got millions of dollars in the bank and you, you've got a, a safety net, you know, I could see where the motivation could be a, an issue, you know, but yeah, yeah. I'm a, I'm a, as you know, right, with my accent, I'm an immigrant. So it, it's, uh, although I, I, you know, my, my parents did okay in South America. When I came here, I was on my own. And it was one day I will tell you, no, no, the recording, but my story. But it's, I got, people helped me out on the way. I got lucky too. But I, I work like a dog, I mean, to, to, sure. to where I am right now and yeah. the schooling and my profession and kind of stuff. So. Yeah, that's, that's a good thing now. It's, it's a very good thing. I mean, it's, it's terrible that parents give everything to the kids. And, uh, uh, and we're kind of in that sort of day and age right now, you know. You need, you, need, you need to earn that, like I did, like I, they did, you know. I agree. I agree, 100%. <laughs> By the way, at the time when you said you were cutting something, you, you have your studio at the time? You, you develop an interest in, in recording as well, not just being a musician? You. Uh, I've always had a keen interest in recording. I mean, from yeah. being a kid, um, th- you know, what really did it for me was uh, I'm going to reference the Beatles again, but yeah. uh, when Paul McCartney released his first solo album, McCartney. Um, and when I heard that he played all the instruments, I went, what? And um, I remember my first Wallen sack tape recorder reel to reel. And it, it did sound on sound. And I'll never forget the first time I harmonized with myself. I went, oh, my goodness. And I've always been fascinated with that. I've almost always wanted to be a recording artist more than live sometimes. I mean, that's just, I've, and ever since then, I've, you know, anything I could do to get near a tape machine. And uh, so I've been recording since I've been 15, 16 years old. Um, you know, I can remember getting my first uh, four track machine or you know then my first eight track machine and then digital came along so i've always recorded always i mean i've got i mean i literally probably have a couple thousand songs on tape i mean i mean a lot of it's crap <laughs> i mean there's probably a, a certain percentage that's that's good but you know that's how you learn you know would keep- you would you would you release that one day or Somebody need to go through and, and listen to, well, well this I, is great, this is okay. I do. I, I go back through my catalog every now and then. I go, well, that's okay. I'll, I'll rewrite that. Yeah. That, that part of the song, that was a good idea. The rest of it's stupid. But, yeah, I, I, I quite often go back and find things that are that I rework. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Well, sure. how, by the way, how many guitars do you have at home? Man, the, the, the video, the, my gear, it's, it's unbelievable. It's uh, you know, very, very well put together. I think I have about 40, I mean, it's, which is not that many when you think about it. For somebody who's been playing guitar all my life, I mean, yeah, I have about 40, you know. Some of them are very, very expensive, right? Yeah, so some of them. Yeah, some of them. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've got a few vintage guitars that are yeah, yeah. From, from the 50s and 60s that I, you know. Paul Gibson and all the other ones, yeah. Yeah, I've got an old Hofner uh, that I bought in England one time that, you know, like the Beatles used to play back in the cavern days, and yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um, but yeah, I, I, yeah. I love, I love guitars. I, I love them to this day. Well, hopefully, you, yes. Well, I don't know. You cannot tell the kids what to do, right? But it's in a way, it's, you know, I, <laughs> you wish that some of them would take take up the stuff. And uh, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to leave them to them. They can do whatever they want with them. You know. Yeah. When, you know. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, well, it's never too late, man. Yeah. <laughs> plus, plus, you know, if you if you're a recording engineer, you don't you don't have to play, right? You need to have a great ear and sound. Stuff and you don't need well, to. Go I, I, I yeah, I think I think I've developed an ear over the years just from listening to records and and like I said, recording all these years. I I have developed an ear. Um, Hmm. I, I, a lot of times I don't really know what I'm doing technically. I just know from I and t- twist the knobs and move the faders until it sounds right to me, you know. But I have learned um, almost uh, what not to do, you know. You know, it, 
a lot of times less is more for making a good sounding recording. You know, don't overdo it. Um, you can muddy things up pretty fast if you're not careful. And, and, that, and I still do that. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll work on a song and I'll put all kinds of parts on it. And then I'll, later I'll come back and go, oh, you overdid it on that one. You don't need all that stuff. And then I'll pull it back and shape it, you know, so to speak. Carve it, as they call it sometimes, to carve it out. Yeah. Yeah. A, a, a distant cousin is a very famous guy. Um, in, uh, he won several Grammys. I never met the guy and he moved to Los Angeles when I was a, a baby, I think. I, young kid, I don't remember. Umberto Gatica. What's his name? Umberto Gatica. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, I've heard that. Yes. Yeah, he's very well known. He won several Grammys. So maybe I should get a hold of the guy Pinkett then to the yeah. for the show. Very cool. Yeah, I remember him for sure. Yeah, he's very famous. I have no, yeah, because I don't know it. I don't know that much about that particular job. I, I cannot tell the difference between a good sound recording engineer versus a bad one. Um, the only point of reference, because I buy whatever is on the market, right? Yeah. But a good point of reference is uh, Steven Wilson. Yeah. Who has taken everybody's stuff, and I want to do, you know, the my, you know, from for Led Zeppelin, for Pink Floyd, from yeah, too many bands at uh, Chicago, and the the uh, Steven Wilson version, and and he's 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 very good, right? because I can listen three, I have three or four different versions, so that's it and I can tell the difference right yeah I mean I've, I've often thought that um, if, if you if you can't tell the difference when it's great then they're doing their job right <laughs> um, you know good editing and good producing is 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 a subtle thing but you know in the end it's uh yeah I don't know like I said I, I'm guessing a lot myself but um, I, I think I know a certain amount. I, I know enough to make something sound good. Yeah. You know. uh, another two songs. Uh, Love You More. Uh, yeah, I wrote that for my wife last year. Um, yeah, beautiful. Kind of, beautiful. I, thank you. I'm, I'm proud of that one, um, to be honest with you. It was, you know, every once in a while, songwriting is hard. Um, uh, in general, it's hard. I can, I can sit down at a piano and I, or a guitar, and I can come up with chords in a melody pretty easy. Um, but lyrics, lyrics are hard. And, um, but that one came out really easy. I mean, it was just, it flowed right out of me. I mean, I, I literally had that written in about a half hour. Um, it, really? it, it took me a day or two to record it, but, but the lyrics, I, I wrote them really fast. They just, it was so natural. And probably because it's authentic. It's, you know, I was writing a, a song for my wife on her birthday. Yeah. And it just it just flowed out of me. So yeah, thank you. I'm I'm proud of that one. I really am. Yeah. Well, tell hello to your wife. If there is for in general, musician, they do the lyrics and then the music they do at the same time. Like Mike McDonald, keep pick up guitar and start making the stuff up. Is well, I mo I mostly do the music first. The lyrics come later. And I think you'll find that's pretty much the majority. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I I I sometimes I have an idea for a lyric. And I'll and I'll hash out the lyrics for a chorus, and then I'll build a song around that. But uh, I, you know, I saw Paul McCartney talk about this just the other day, and he says after all these years of writing, he still doesn't understand how it happens because if there is a certain magic to it. It's like I'll hear a melody, and sometimes words will just come out, and I have no idea what they mean, and but they sound right. Yeah. And, And then so then I'll go, well, what does that mean? And then I'll build a song around what I'm hearing. And then it starts to make sense. Um, but yeah, generally, I like to write the music first. Um, you, you play piano, too, no just guitar, right? Yeah, I, 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 write, I, I write about 50-50. 50-50, yeah. 50-50. Yeah. I, I love writing on piano because um, there's, there's just so, much, so many more possibilities to me. Uh, you know, you can just... You can go more places than you can on a guitar, in my opinion. Mm. Um, yeah, but and it almost more melodic. But and and I and I love transposing stuff that I've written on piano over to guitar. That's like that's really great because it makes the guitar more interesting to me too, and yeah. vice versa. Vice versa. Yeah. It's another song. The the world around me. What a beautiful song that is to have. Thank that that. Thank you. That that that's. Uh, 
the world around me. Yeah, that's it. I'm trying to remember that one. <laughs> so many, too many songs to remember. But that's thank right, you. man. Thank you. Beautiful. Thing. What about if you can go over the, the making of the, the Blue Obsession with yeah. Michael? Yeah, that, that actually Beautiful Child was written during that project and it, it didn't.